have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth, a crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature who has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. I exist. And if I speak one thought out loud, that thought exists, even after I'm shoveled into my grave. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth! Delusions! The Bible! Poetry! Enemies! All kind! All of it appropriate! To make you think you have a strength when you have no strength at all! You have nothing but spindly limbs in a dream! And the state has no use for your kind! Yeah? Well, we're gonna have to do something about that. This is RiverWestRadio.com, community-supported radio, streaming live from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm your host, my name is Michael Wordsworth, and welcome to Breaking Down the News, the show that presents the news highlights of the week, but with a twist. Breaking Down the News is more concerned in bringing you information that wasn't covered on the front pages. Headlines you don't want to miss, because not listening could be dangerous to your freedom, liberty, and health. And good afternoon on this Monday, May 21st, 2012 edition. I am Michael Wordsworth, and these are words worth listening to. I went through a lot of news articles pertaining to NATO Summit this weekend. I was attempted to gain an overall perspective of the situation, taking a look at all the news sources, And many articles from mainstream media reported the arrest of potential terrorists, suggesting they had actually foiled terrorist plots. But if you read deeper into these articles, one finds out that the three suspected of making pipe bombs were in fact only brewing beer. They were in possession of beer bottles. That's it. No other report that I could find confirmed the actual existence of explosive materials. A general mood of fear pervaded Chicago this weekend, or at least that is what the media news has implied through the articles I I read. Sounds like all the security is truly justified when one reads those reports. I'm going to go over some interesting points that happened this weekend. It was a confusing situation. I mean, given that most people don't know exactly what NATO is discussing inside their meeting, um, few headlines or few people I'm sure actually checked into that. I mean, this is the thing we're protesting. I'm hoping to go over some of this. As for the protests themselves, let me just give you a general idea of how things went. Uh, In a massive show of force, police and riot gear clashed violently with protesters at the end of the anti-NATO summit march on Sunday afternoon. Police Superintendent Gary MacArthur, he later said 45 people were arrested. The clash occurred at 22nd Street and Michigan Avenue, a few blocks away from where President Obama and other world leaders were meeting in secret. As the protesters tried to leave the rally at the end of a huge NATO march, McCarthy was seen right in the middle of the fray directing his officers. Police were yelling at the crowd to move back as some of the protesters tried to rupture the line and threw objects at the officers. Very unbecoming. The objects bounced off police officers who wore riot control gear. No need to fear. The officers were drinking plenty of water and they were up on their feet including uh, protective visors. Several people could be seen being taken into custody from time to time. That was just kind of, uh, you had a lot of random arrest. It was a very interesting pushing, shoving match. But it was really the live video coverage provided by CNN that showed the pushing and shoving the best. The camera angles were mostly from above, looking down on the crowds of protesters, pressed into a wall against crowds of riot police. It was incredible. The gray, smooth helmets were all on, one could see, the, the dark uniforms were underneath, and you, you had all these little sea of heads on the, over the black of these little gray helmets. Lots of pushing and shoving, pushing and shoving, tensions mounted on both sides. At one point, the metal barricades that they used to separate the crowds, it looks like a giant metal rack. It was hoisted up into the air onto the crowd and passed back and forth between the police and citizens for a moment before tensions turned rougher down the street. I heard the announcer say they are bringing in the Elrad cannon. And the screen went blank for a minute right after that. I mean, the announcer said, 
And it appears that they're bringing in the LRAD. I mean, at that point, there was no cause for such a device to be pulled out. I mean, there was a mounting escalation, and there was this point where the protesters were attempting to get farther in their uh, movement, and the police basically drew a line and said, this is as far as you can go, whatever protesting you're going to do. And then it's a process where they just kind of like a football game. They make that line, and then they push them back and gain some ground. But the LRAD is a very nasty sonic device, effective at crowd control and painful to the ears. The crowd chanted in protest but would not budge. I don't think they could have moved if they wanted to since they were so packed in at the dividing line where the police made their stand. CNN truly had a good shot of the street below, below, though. The camera panned up and down the street at this massive standoff. Minutes passed, little happened. The announcer made a few comments and the whole city seemed oddly inactive given the potential hostilities pending. Did the people on the street know the Elrad Sound Canyon had been called for? Everyone stood their ground, remaining still, while cameramen took many digital photos, but then few people started to disperse from the back. And uh, that was the beginning of the protesters themselves to actually subside. Um, When the screen came back on, the LRAD cannon was out, and they they showed a shot of that. And uh, there were some announcements by the police on megaphone, it was difficult to hear off the CNN feed. The audio was just not pumped up enough, or they couldn't get mics down there. Then, uh, the for whatever reason, the screen went black again. Uh, the uh, came back on. Protesters were beginning to disturb, disperse. I mean, the whole scene was really, uh, you know, it's. It was much just a standoff with a lot of pushing and shoving, but really the police didn't seem agitated and the people on the ground didn't seem agitated. The ones that were throwing things, you know, those are always the few, those are the agitators. I mean, they exist on both sides. Police can have provocateurs. uh, Protesters can have uh, agitators. Same difference. I mean, it's trying to incite violence where there need not be violence. Um, But... uh, not much happened until later towards the end of the whole thing where they, you know, came out with these articles saying, yeah, there was a big clash, but eh, not too many people were arrested. They did have uh, the Chicago, according to the Chicago Tribune, hackers were claimed to, well, at least it, it was claimed that hackers took claim for credit for bringing down the city of Chicago.org site. And the Chicago Police.org site, according to Twitter feeds this morning, those feeds said something like, we are aware of the potential issue with the city's website and working the problems out, blah, blah, blah. But uh, other than that, you know, there really wasn't much. Um, I thought things were going to be much more disastrous. It really sounded like there was uh, largely just a demonstration of the people clashing with the... Um, idea of the police who were under orders to maintain a line given uh, I understand the president was there and NATO was there and uh, you have these world leaders and they have to you know make it appear that we have sanity in this country but for the same token it's interesting because we're supposed to be uh, a country about the first amendment and the right to protest personally you want my opinion I don't think protests are really effective uh, there at least is not as effective as actual political will, actually taking steps as a unified people. Solidarity doesn't need to be. That's It's a little old-fashioned. In the old days, we'd have to show up at the castle with torches and pitchforks. The difference was back then, when, we, when the peasants were protesting, they meant it. The king knew he was in trouble. I mean, the, if the army was out on some crusade and he had no backup, his uh, imperial guard wasn't enough, ooh, things could get ugly. Or if it was on the Senate floor, you know, any of the Caesar got stabbed by his own Senate. <laughs> they all just stabbed him. So, I mean, it's a tough call. So, but today we protest. It's kind of an antiquated. I'm not trying to discourage people from, you know, some people have no other means but to go out and say, hey, I protest. But I mean, if you really protest, why don't you start taking steps towards actually hurting these guys in their pocketbooks or showing that it's not just voting. Voting isn't the only, I mean, in theory, voting is supposed to work because you're going to have representatives in there that represent you. But most of you people out there, 
Yeah, not actually, I'm sure the people listening to this show, for whatever reason, I bet you they're more informed. But there's a good percentage of people in America. Were I broadcasting live to America, I could say, look, there's a good percentage of you out there who just really have no clue. And it makes it all too easy for the uh, truly elite, those who truly have power, to just steer society, social engineer it, buy off the politicians. Hey, all the politicians are in there because they were bought off. They have something hanging over their head, otherwise they wouldn't be there, especially the higher up in power structure, the more that's true. It's true that if you step out of line, they're gonna, they don't have to assassinate somebody. I mean, when you're riding that good life, uh, prostitutes and uh, prestige and all oh, the favors, the money, uh, there must be some reason why these grease balls gravitate towards this position most honest good citizens can't handle it but they don't really get in there do they the congressmen that have made it to uh in their early freshman year they they reported look when i got in there i had all these idealistic thoughts that i could actually make a change but look it's a complicated system and it's meant to be complicated so that there is no real effective um input from the people it's all political polls uh, what and which goes back to the old days when we were peasants on the farmland of the town, and the people would say, uh, the king would say, you know, uh, how are the what's the general mood of the peasants? You know, and they'd say, sire, the peasants are revolting, and he'd say they most certainly are, and it either went one way or the other. Either the king was ousted, and uh, some new tyrant would come along. I mean, that's kind of the point. It's history repeating itself over and over. Until one day, one day humanity collectively will have a percentage great enough to actually affect the change and maintain it as necessary. That change would be first to wake up to our true situation. Then second, second, work towards a common goal that is in our common interest, collectively, but not in the communist sense. I think that... What, what's not acknowledged, uh, there's factors involved why there's a problem in the first place. Honestly, my blunt opinion, there all, will always be a certain percentage of people that are lazy. Now, I don't mean to, I can be lazy, you can be lazy, anybody can be lazy, but the question is, are you contribution to society? And you know what? The, that's a double-edged sword when I said that. By contribution to society, I meant genuinely, but that could be interpreted as another sort of uh, eugenics-type platform where they say, look, you know, you're just breathing air. You're, you're, you're useless. As far as they're concerned, we're all useless. They don't need us anymore. They don't need the fat-consuming cow to go out and buy everything and go moo, moo, moo at the bars and at the sporting events and even at church, the church groups. Mmm. So, yeah, I'm uh, trying to go to the public a little bit out there. I, I realize that people actually listening to the show probably do care. I mean, they do care about issues, and it's not to say that they wouldn't like to be more informed. They would. I understand we're busy. I have a strange obsession with combing the news and seeing how it relates to the overall geopolitical movements in the world. It's what I do. My name is Michael Wordsworth. We're at Breaking Down the News. We'll be back in a second. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. And we're back. We're going to change from Chicago. We're going to move slowly to the house where the GOP House leadership has sent a letter to General Attorney General Eric Holder demanding, and they sent a letter to General Attorney General Eric Holder. Some of you might not know who he is, but uh, he uh, is, well, well, you'll find out. This, this guy, he's ruffled a few feathers, mostly because he's taking the fall at the moment for something that Bush himself did in 2006 under a different name. And now... Um, it was carried out again, and the, the news is picking it up. It's out there in the media. You have to, all you have to do is type in Eric Holder, and you'll see Fast and Furious come up. 
Fast and Furious is the name of the program where our government government quite recently traded guns, cash, for drugs. That's right. Our government, in a secret operation, attempted, or at least it was alleged, that's what they say, they were going to track the weapons. It was tried in 2006. It didn't work out too well, and... Well, it came back again in this new program, and the media found out about it, and here we go. It's actually in the public, but not many people are aware of it, and that's why I'm talking to you about it. I'm breaking down the news. So Holder is the one that they have to, uh, you know, he's the attorney general. He's the one that, uh, you know, in the legal sense, he's the one responsible. He's the sheriff in town. And they demand he comply with the subpoena, ordering him to provide more documents about the failed Obama, Obama administration gun tracking program known as fast and furious they always got to give it some cool name don't they i mean that's why if you're you know if you're working for these guys the bureau of alcohol and tobacco firearms they they tend to attract guys that are single have tattoos do steroids you know a real guy guy but uh you know dare i say they're not too bright and some of them the ones that have anything on the ball those tend to be the ones that are the paid-for cops. They're the ones on the secret dole. They're the ones working behind the scene in the cadres of evil that do exist throughout our entire system. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive Program was created in the first place to send thousands, I mean, uh, not to send thousands of guns across the Mexican border. It was, <laughs> I suppose you could just use UPS for that. You, you could drive them across the border yourself. But uh, why would we be sending thousands of guns across the border into Mexico? Well, the truth is we were arming the cartels that were paying us. The new ones, the old ones weren't paying us money to the banks. I shouldn't say us because you and I are not connected to this in any way. So uh, I got to stop saying that. So they, they had to pay off the right, the right bankers. The money's funneled some way. I mean, you're talking about a $500 billion industry a year. And it's amazing how they're able to launder that money just right underneath our noses. Hey, Brokovia Bank, before it went down, it was uh, mainstream media news. I believe Bloomberg just clicked Wachovia Bank, laundered drug cartel money. You will see in Google News come up. Boom. There it is. <laughs> it's amazing. I forgot. It was $276 billion that they laundered, and they received something like a $114 million fine. Boy, I will make that deal any day, except I couldn't do it for drugs, because although I believe the drug war should be ended, I am not for drugs. I think they are a destructive force in society. They existed 100 years ago. We sold them in pharmacies, but generally it was looked down upon if you were a drug user. It was something that wasn't chic and cool and made all fancy by Hollywood movies and sold to our youth as something that's exciting. Well, anyhow, moving on. Let's find out what happened to the record, the weapons. Well, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive Program was created to send thousands of guns across the Mexico border suspe- to suspected arms bill dealers. These were, this was a special division within the middle of the Bureau. And basically with the expectation that they would lead to organizers of Mexican drug cartels. They could just track them the way they follow them and see where they go. And this would just kind of uncover the whole ring. Uh, And even arms smuggling. Well, however, the weapons reportedly turned up in street crimes across Mexico. Well, that was an easy one. Hundreds reportedly remain missing. They just don't know where those things went. But at least two were found at the scene of a 2010 gunfight between smugglers and the U.S. Border Patrol in which Agent Brian Terry was fatally shot. I mean, that's when the news media really had to get involved with this because here we have guns that we sent to Mexican cartel members. Talk about lack of foresight. If you send out thousands of guns... What do you think to Mexican drug cartels just to track them? It's a, like you might as well give a gun to a four year old and say, Here, go play. I turned off the safety. It's already locked and loaded, baby. Go at it. Because, I mean, really, what do you think these, these guys are going to do with the guns? Hunt? Well, in any case, 
The American people deserve to know how much such a fundamentally flawed operation could have continued for so long and have a full accounting of who knew of and approved an operation that placed weapons in the hands of drug cartels, said the letter sent Friday by House Speaker Representative John Boner. House Majority Leader Republican Eric Cantor and House Majority uh, Re- Representative Kevin McCarthy, also Representative Daryl Issa, Chairman of the Chamber's Investigative Committee. Issa wants to put Holder in contempt of Congress for failing to comply with the October 2011 subpoena. I mean, that was a while ago, right? And he was. Uh, this is, apparently this has been going on since then. This is amazing. House members say Holder has provided only select information. Uh, I saw Janet Reno actually. Uh, being interviewed on this once and uh oh she was good uh, no i don't i don't believe i had any uh i don't believe that's a disclaimer right there any knowledge of this event really you didn't know about the gu- what do you guys do up there somebody had to know somebody had to admit it so that's why holder had to take the fall in this whole thing and he, he says he tried to flip it around she called me a hero why you moron for authorizing this idiotic policy you should have said no way will i do this because it would just end my career are you nuts but you know it's mess up and move up if he gets passes this one and sells it to the public that this was okay and you know we buy his lies and go oh once again we believe you thank you for uh doing something as asinine as this so any, uh, I tell you, Holder has approved what is required for the con- congressional investigations. So it is said. All options are on the table. Table. They love that phrase. Boner replied in an interview taped Friday for ABC. Uh, it's going to air this week Sunday. So I guess you'll be able to say Boner. See Boner on Sunday. Say. <laughs> All options are on the table. You know, Hillary loves that line. Oh, yeah, yes, uh, with Syria, uh, all options. Oh, uh, Libya, all, all options. Iran, all options would, of course, be on the What options does a table actually possess? I mean, usually it's the fork and spoon and bowl. There might be a candle. I don't really know where this metaphor comes from. Uh, but we know it's a euphemism that says, really, what it means is, we're prepared to screw you if you mess us up. I mean, I could have put that <laughs> I could have made my point more succinct if I used actual words but uh, that were more vulgar but uh, basically yes 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 uh, that's what all options on the table means hey buddy don't want mess with us because we're ready to break it out we're just just try me just try me we'll, we'll kill you if we have to that's right we'll just kill you so anyhow or at least find out we got that thing that we hold over your head. All those guys, including President Obama, everybody in the White House, they got something that you could just bring them down there. One little dirty secret or 10,000 dirty secrets hiding in the closet that would just do them in politically. And believe me, when you lose your job as a political, you know, you kind of you become a lame duck, so to speak. Uh, what are you going to do? Nobody's going to listen to your tours and interviews and, you know, want to buy your books. Anyhow, this is a Fast and Furious. I will keep you up to date on this situation because it's one of the many things going on behind the scenes that really doesn't get pressed in the news. I select these issues personally. There are so many. I have to triage them and get them into uh, this Word doc here and make sure that I I actually structure the shows to provide you the most information, the most relevant and pertinent information I can in the three times that I'm on. I'm on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 3.30 to 5 or 3.30 to 6. We uh, do have a Facebook. Uh, We're so progressive here. Everybody has a Facebook, so we got to have one. It's Breaking Down the News. Put all together. Now, there's no spaces in between the letters, just like an email name, breaking down the news. And then, of course, our email is breaking down the news at gmail.com. Of course, you can leave a message on Facebook as well. The number to call in right now is 414 935 2951. I always encourage people that agree or disagree, please call in. Uh, we, we could use some antagonism on this show. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to take a short little break. When I come back, we're going to talk about something that happened right here in Wisconsin. I usually don't get to report on this too often, but apparently the police are robbing the citizens in Brown County, Wisconsin, and that's just the way it is. You don't like it? Huh? You don't like it? I'll be right back. 
You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. so back live here on this Monday, beautiful Monday afternoon. My goodness, it's gorgeous. It's cool. I'm not a weatherman, so usually I don't report such fluffy issues, but our broadcasting studio is located in the front section of River West Video. I'm sure anybody know, that knows about River West Radio is aware of the video store that is here as well. It's a delightful, quaint place. It's indicative of what makes River West a unique community. Uh, it's located right next to the coffee shop that's been around here since day one. I think it was like the first one actually in Milwaukee that had the strong coffee and was technically an actual long before Starbucks pulled in here. There was Fuel Cafe and I'm sure anybody on the east side knows about Fuel Cafe. Well, what they might not know about is one of the more interesting news articles Brown County, Wisconsin Drug Task Force arrested her son, Joel, last February. Who? Beverly Greer. Her son, when she went down to pick, put together the bail, it was confiscated. The bail money was confiscated. She used part of her disability payment. Now, I'll tell you why it was confiscated in a second. I'll give you the legal justification, and then you, as an informed citizen, can decide, is this right? And I'm reading this one article because when you see one cockroach, you know there's a 1,000 or 10,000 in the wall. It's just the way it is. So anyhow, she used part of her disability payment and her tax return to do this bail. Joel Greer's wife also chipped in, as did his brother and two sisters, on February, February 29th, a judge set Greer's bail at $7,500. And his mother called the Brown County Jail to see where and how she could get him out. And they said, yeah, bring us $7,500 cash. And, you know, the police, quote to quote Miss Greer, the police specifically told us to bring cash. And you're thinking, you know, maybe if you're going to buy something off the black market, you'd be thinking twice, you know, we'll have cash. It could rob us. But when you're going down to the police station, you don't generally think the police are going to rob us. And if they did, couldn't you just say, you, well, you're the police. Can't you arrest yourself? No, it doesn't work that way. They were specific. The police told Miss Greer, Mrs. Greer, not a cashier's check or a credit card. They said cash. I mean, did these officers need cocaine that night, or what is the deal? Like, uh, why, why would you need cash so bad? Just that you turn to this level of open corruption. I mean, you can at least admire people that do things on a local level and get away with it, you know, not without hurting people. But, I mean, like, you know, like the white-collar crimes, as they call them, uh, victimless crimes. I'm not sure what you want to call it. Uh, I'm against extortion myself. Nobody likes being extorted. But in this case, the police were the extorters. I mean, this is like mafia. They told her, bring cash down here. Well, the Greer and her family visited a series of ATMs, and on March 1st, they scraped up, like three days later, enough money to bring to the jail, thinking she'd be taking her son, Joel Greer, home. But she left without her money and her son. That's like... Let that sink in. So <laughs> the woman goes to pay the bill. She goes down there, gives them the money, and you're, it's gone. That's it. Can I have my son? Is it? No, we told you $7,500 in cash, and you have, in fact, given us that money. But now we're going to just stand here stupidly looking you in the face saying, yeah, 
your son's staying in jail. That's just the way it is. I'd like to get into, you know, why was he in jail in the first place? We'll, we'll find out. Instead of jail officials, officials, I love officials. If you listen to my show, you understand that officials drive me nuts because what makes an official official? Well, you and me authorizing their authority. That's what makes them officials in the first place. Peace officers are supposed to be officers of the of the city, I mean, true civil servants. Otherwise, they're called jackboot thugs that go around pushing you around in society. And society has to stand up against that and not tolerate it by complaining to people that are supposedly be the movers and shakers, the leaders, and do something about it. Here we have a case where the whole system breaks down, and this is indicative. This very situation is indicative of how corrupt and crazy it is. And it's not, we should be concerned. It gets worse, and it continues to get worse. So at least, you know, if you can't do much, I always say if you're broke, you can afford to pay attention and uh, listen to the show. Breaking Down the News is on River West Radio three days a week. I think collectively it's like seven hours, and we're archived there. And I guarantee you, I try not to fluff up the conversations too much. I try to just bring you the relevant news. (laughs) So anyhow, uh, instead of giving her some back, The jail officials called in the same drug task force that arrested her son. A drug-sniffing dog. So, I mean, if these guys are the same guys that arrested him, you got to question if he's guilty in the first place. Just a quid pro quo. A drug-sniffing dog inspected the cash that they brought in, and about a half hour later, guess what happened? A police officer told her the dog had alerted them to the presence of narcotics on the bill. So they brought the money, they laid it on the table, they said, come here, Rover, come here, boy. Okay, which one's got cocaine on it? The dog said, oh, this one and this one. Well, can I let you know something, America? It's estimated, I don't know, like two to three bills out of every seven. That would be a, a safe estimate. Are tainted with minute amounts of cocaine from those who have used them, especially $20 bills. They've been the favorite for decades. So basically, it's not that shocking. It is, it, it is what, in a court of law, the judge would have to say circumstantial evidence. It does not conclusively prove anything. I mean, you have enough sense out there. I know the listeners actually have enough sense to go, yeah, some dog can't just sniff the bills and say, yeah, I think these guys are doing coke. Anyhow, that was the justification. And they let them know that they would be confiscating the bail money. <laughs> ain't that up? I wanted to say it. I want ain't that up? So uh, Beverly Greer said, I told them the money had just come from the bank. We had just taken it out. If the money had drugs on it, then they should go seize all the money at the bank too. I just don't understand how they could do She's right. You know what I mean? For that pretense, damn it, let's get the dogs in the banks right now. Oh, hell, can I have in on this action? I wish I had my own private security force. I'd get a contract for the government saying... I'm going to take drug-sniffing dogs into the banks and stores. Well, I can't pick on the banks because they're too low-level ones I could. They, they, I could get away with that because they're not, you know, nobody cares. They're way low on the totem pole. But I could do that with the central banks, you know, obviously. But, okay, so I'm going to go around to cash registers all over America with my private security force. I'm going to get a government contract to do it. And when I come into your privately-owned business, I'm going to have my dog sniff your cash. And if the dog goes woof or raises its paw or whatever stupid thing it's done to try and find its little cute toy then I'm going to take your cash and here's how it works the government's going to take a percentage and I'm going to get to keep a percentage for just being the dog that goes around collecting your money that's how it's done I mean there is I obviously don't do this and I am being facetious when I say I want to do this but you know I mean if I if there I didn't truly believe there were good people out there, there were people of conscience, there were people that would like to be more informed but find it difficult because they don't know what news to believe. And yeah, take me. I spent a significant time. It's like actually four or five years research, researching my sources and actually following this progression <laughs> that's happening all the time. So anyhow. The Greers have been subjected to civil asset forfeiture, 
I love that. When I steal your money, you call it, I robbed you. I jacked you up. When the police do it, they call it a civil asset for, forfeiture. <laughs> a policy that lets police confiscate money. They don't steal it. They confiscate. Yes, I'm going to confiscate your money now. And property, even if they could only loosely connect them to drug activity. I mean, that's all it takes. I mean, just, uh, I mean it, that we started not being concerned about circumstantial evidence a while ago and i guess this is how you give them an inch they take a mile you know and you give them enough rope apparently they'll hang themselves and this is what they're doing uh all it takes is enough people out there to go yeah i heard about these issues this issue or any issues and just yeah i don't believe the sucker that gets up there see the politicians are elected to try and sell you the lie and then you decide if you like this brand or that brand this version or that version that's all that's going on. You, you like the illusion of participation versus the actual participation in the process. Um, you might argue, I, I don't, I'm not just involved. And yeah, you know what? I, I'd have to agree that a lot of these issues, sometimes you can spend a lot of time studying this for years and really to get your mind to have an intelligent opinion to make on these issues but fortunately there are people out there that have no shortage of opinions and i'd like to hear them at 414-935-2951 otherwise if nobody calls in i'm just going to keep on reading this exceptional news i mean just kind of all right we got to get past the greers here there, there is a happy story so as paul harvey would say and now the rest of the story it took four months for Beverly Greer to get her family's back. I apologize, her family's money back. <laughs> yeah, either way, it took four months. And then only after attorney Andy Williams agreed to take their case. You got to gotta get your own dog in the ring there. They don't believe you. You can't, you know, you need an attorney. You know, uh-oh, guy's got a suitcase. Remember what the godfather said, Don Corleone, one attorney is worth a hundred men with guns. And he's right. The pen is mightier than the sword. It remains true even in our day and age with digital computers. The family produced the ATM receipts. That was the final evidence that got the whole case settled. They said, look, here's the receipts from the ATM machine proving that we had recently withdrawn the money. They had documentation for her disability check and her tax return, and that proved the source of their income. But even then, the police tried to keep their money. It didn't hold up because what judge, now the, at this level, the judge is thinking, you know, for 7500 bucks, I'm only going to get a percentage of this. The media is already on top of it. This could leak out. Maybe this wouldn't be such a good idea. Look, he probably told the police officers, look, you idiots, from now on, you got to chill out with this stuff. 7500 is a little too high. They got to find the right price equilibrium. Uh, let me give advice to the evil policemen out there. Think about this. Really, you don't want to overtax the populace too much. That's always been the problem. How to find the exact percentage to tax them to make revenue enough for you to line your pockets and, you know, take out your prostitute girlfriend while you're cheating on your wife. Uh, but not completely piss off the people. It's, it's a fine line, and I think $7,500 was a bit too high, a little too greedy, but, you know, amateur evil people got to learn lessons the hard way. They're amateur evil. It's become obsolete, antiquated. There's real evil professionals with a high-tech scientific technocracy, uh, a form of government that uses scientific understandings to manipulate the populations. They understand polls, making them, creating them. No polls are actually, it's, it's understood. I mean, get this. <laughs> None of the polls are actual representations when, even even the ones that back up my information, I, I seldom use polls to verify my point as valid because polls are subjected to, well, what basically you pay the polling company money to find out what you want to know and represent through the poll. That's how it works. That's why they take your money. And then they put their reputation on the line and you know, much like a bank is uh, solvent as long as you believe you can get your money out at any time, you won't go make a run on the bank, but the moment that becomes in question, you go and run and get your money. That's the same way with this. 
Anyhow, I guess it did have a somewhat happy ending. Uh, they got their money back. They got their son back. And I'm sure these cops learned a lesson about charging too much money. That's the way it goes in a crazy world. I'm Michael Wordsworth. These are words worth listening to. I'm breaking down the news. Riverwestradio.com. You're listening to Riverwestradio.com. Forty-one years ago, Congress told the U.S. Postal Service to start acting like an independent business and pay its own way. Kind of like the parents telling you, you need to get a job and move out. Well, every time the Postal Service tries, something stands in its way. This time, Congress. Face, uh, this time, facing annual losses of $18.2 billion by 2015 and a possible default this year. The Postal Service has a five-year plan for profitability. Well, that's kind of like saying to your kid, you know, get out, get a job, and uh, I'm going to loan you some money, but uh, when are you going to pay me back? And they're saying, your son says, well, I have a five-year plan for profitability. Well, that's nice and everything, but, you know, my bills are due today. In any case, the Postal Service, much like a prodigal son, wants to end Saturday mail delivery, close hundreds of letter sorting facilities and thousands of post offices, and consider, get this, Wisconsin, breaking union contracts to fire employees. Oh, what a move there. Huh? I know that isn't popular. Does that get you, Wisconsin citizens, I mean, does that get you... Uh, riled up. Uh, got a lot of union supporters here. In fact, we're going to have a show about the unions one day. This is a, something that, if anything, needs clearing. I'm mean, getting out in the air. It's an open discussion on unions because both sides have points and uh, the paradigm keeps us from discussing them. Anyhow, I didn't mean to get into that. I'm talking about the post office and it wants to uh, cut your Saturday service close hundreds of uh, letter sorting facilities and thousands of post offices. Hey, let me tell you something. What if the internet went down? <laughs> what if there was a, or how about there's a lot of communities that have no internet service. They rely on the post offices, elderly people for their checks, uh, for ordering things, for receiving things. And you want to, oh, uh, well, anyhow, <clears throat> I don't know. I guess it's kind of a, uh, it's a confusing issue because, I mean, the U.S. Postal Service is not an actual division of the government, but they're incredibly subsidized, and I wish I knew exactly what the contract was with them. And is this actually socialized postal delivery? I don't really know, and that's not the question, but they are considering breaking union contracts to fire employees, and they also want to set up an independent health plan, raise postal rates, <laughs> again, and enter lines of business such as delivering wine and liquor. Now, that's interesting. In, in Milwaukee here, the one thing that sells is booze. We, The only places opening up really are booze joints. And uh, that's, that's the thing that, well, we drink more booze than anybody. <laughs> that's the situation. Moving on to America and the situation with the economy, the unemployment crisis in America is much worse than you are being told. Did you know that there are 100 million working age Americans that do not get up in the morning and go to work? 100 million. No wonder why it seems like there are so many people that do not have jobs. <laughs> They're all wandering around, grabbing a coffee, going to the library. <laughs> According to the federal government, there are 12.6 million working-age Americans that are considered to be officially unemployed, but there are another 87.8 million working-age Americans that are not working altogether. The federal government considers those Americans to be not in the labor force, so they are not included in the unemployment rate. 
And it's the way they shift the figures. They don't want you to know the economy isn't that bad. It's horrible. But they don't want you to know that. It's like Hitler reporting back to the Germans. The war is going good. Everything's fine, you citizens. Yeah. Well, uh, apologize if I offended any German people, but, you know, we grew up making fun of the Nazis, so it's still one of the few politically correct things to be. And I was making fun of the Nazi party, not the actual German people. I just wanted to make that clear. All right. In fact, uh, the German people showed up. 200,000 people hit the streets over this last week in protest. So it sounds to me like the German people, they're aware. Uh, they understand that the same scam is being pulled onto them. They're being sucked into Greece's debt and the Euro's debt, and they're supposed to bail them out the same way the American tax people were supposed to bail out the banks, EIG, Fannie, and Freddie Mac. Anyhow, um, let's stay on target here. Let's stay on target. We're talking about the labor force. <laughs> the Obama, Obama administration would have us believe that the unemployment rate is going down and that since the start of the last recession, about as many Americans have left the labor force as we saw during the entire decades of the 80s and 90s combined. Of course, that is a bunch of nonsense. But that is what the Obama administration would have us believe. The truth is that the percentage of working Americans that are actually employed is just about the same right now as it was two years ago. If you have a job, you're keeping it. If you don't, it's another story. It's a new prejudice against people that don't have jobs. They don't want to hire them. Suddenly you're, you're icky and contaminated because there must be something wrong. Yeah, I live in a depressed economy. That's why I don't have a job and I'm applying for one because I want work. It's like, well, we have to take the people that actually have jobs. It makes more sense. Hey, to all the uh, people hiring out there, if you want to help the economy, don't hire people that have jobs. Hire people that don't have jobs. It makes more sense. That's just my opinion. I don't know. Do with that what you want there. If you still do have a good job, you might want to get a good hold on to it. And don't let go, though, because there's not too much hope that things are going to improve significantly anytime soon. How can I say that? Well, I can say that by the percentage of Americans awake to the actual issues that are screwing them. They like to complain about the pretend issues while they get screwed thinking that they're participating, being trendy, cool, or whatever it is, remaining aloof from politics, you can't afford it. <laughs> you just can't afford to remain aloof these days. It's the way it goes. I'm Michael Wordsworth. We're tearing it up with the news this afternoon on a lovely Monday afternoon. Take care, and I'll talk to you in two seconds. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. The U.S. Justice Department and the Federal Bureau of Investigation in New York have begun a criminal probe of J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Two billion trading loss, a person familiar with the matter said, two billion. The U.S. is looking into whether criminal wrongdoing occurred in relation to the losses the bank reported last week, said the person. The person who declined to be identified because the matter isn't public yet. The inquiry is in its most preliminary stage, said such person. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates derivatives trading, also are examining the New York-based J.P. Morgan's trading activities, according to people familiar with those probes. J.P. Morgan Chief Executive Officer Jamie Dimon said on May 10th that the bank made egregious mistakes and that the losses of about $2 billion tied to a synthetic credit securities were self-inflicted. 
<laughs> Can I translate that for you? Can I break down the news for you? First off, whenever uh, somebody at these high levels of position and power have to explain themselves, they always have to pull out a vocabulary word that you, the viewer, may not know. Not to insult my viewers, some uh, I'm sure have great vocabularies. But uh, mostly, you know, the people in general, uh, when they listen to tune into the issues, I'm... They're blown away. Uh, everything's put into some sort of code word. That's why I tell uh, my children that you need to learn vocabulary words so you understand how they're screwing you. I mean, when a man's looking you in the face and insulting you, you need to know that. It's important. Well, if you don't learn your vocabulary, you won't know how you're getting screwed, and you won't understand that they're just treating you like children that are, oh, this is too much. Don't be concerned about this little bank corruption here. Uh, go about your lives. Play with your toys. It's not going to happen to you. Well, it did happen to many people. Uh, let's not forget that John Corzine recently, the, the Teflon Don, or we should call him the Teflon John, Corzine with MF Global put a 40 to 1 bet and lost. It cost his company that when he was the for, uh, CEO of it at the time, that, that action later caused this company to lose $2 billion worth of customer accounts. So uh, MF Global is like an, like an investment bank. You can't really put money into it, but you, if you have money, you can do investments. You can get investment funds. So you put your money in there, and they say your money's gone. Why? Ugh. John Corzine made a bet. He thought that bonds were going to go long and that he'd be able to float at least throughout two, till 2012, and he didn't realize that the European bond market was going to be a, a little bit of a problem. And it was, and it cost us $2 billion. Well, not you and I, but some farmers in Minnesota. Some farmers in Minnesota, they actually suffered the losses. That hits home. That's you. That's me. We are those farmers. The rights of one individual are the rights of all. And when we get pecked down by the lion over there and we act like sheep and don't come back and, you know, repel the attack and don't care about each other, that's when civilization is doomed to fail. Society breaks down slowly until it can no longer maintain a good, decent people. People become afraid. They panic, and in desperation, they lose their morality. Some of us not having much to begin with, but I'm talking about even the fake veneer that they put over society, that they pump on television. Even that'll go. The news reporters won't come up there every night with the pleasant look, looking you deep in the eyes, making you feel like you care, their friends on TV, and tell you that, well, although these terrible things are happening, everything's normal because that is normal. Terrible things go on all the time. Good news. You know, honestly, it's really hard. There is good news out there. There is. All the time people are doing good things, and uh, there are good realizations, but we learn from our failures, not our successes, and uh, bad news seems to uh, lead. They say if it bleeds, it leads. And uh, it's kind of a junk food diet. It really, it's kind of a junk food diet. Americans, are they, they don't want to take the longer version of news, such as breaking down the news. We're able, we've got uh, an hour and a half, two hours to get a little bit more in depth, but most news stations don't. So that's the way it goes. We're going to take a little break again. Uh, shortly after this, let me finish this article. Uh, we had uh, the number of Federal Housing Administration insured home owning lenders entering foreclosure. These foreclosures jumped in March after half the mortgages it modified to ease repayment terms were in default again a year or more later. This is with the FHA. The FHA's role in lending to first time buyers with poor credit and limited cash expanded after the 2008 collapse of the mortgage market, market put it at the center of government efforts to revive housing. The FHA allows down payments as low as 3.5% for borrowers and a credit score of 580, below the 640 defined as subprime by the Federal Reserve. The credit standards are way too loose. You can get into a house with very little skin in the game, and if home prices drop by a small amount, you're underwater. Be aware of that. 
Underwater means your house is worth less than what you owe. You might as well be underwater at that point. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. 1,200 people this year alone have committed suicide over losing their homes. That's pretty heavy. Glad you're not one of them. I'm not one of them, but I take heart. I can imagine that would be tough. David Lichen, the managing partner at Mortgage Banking Solutions, he said, we've got to start getting reasonable about standards. What they've done so far, some very slight attempts at tightening, doesn't really count. Well, let's get on that, people. <laughs> Actually, uh, it really says buyer beware. Buyer beware, because uh, in the old days, you had to come up with 20%, and that was pretty sound. That was a good sound investment. I mean, sure, everybody would like to get into a home for less than 20%, but as the loans break out and the statistics of us keeping our jobs and actually paying off the 30-year mortgage, 10, 20, 30, I don't care, three-year mortgage, um, the risk's lower, and you have more principal put into it. So just look, buyer beware. If they come along saying, we got this great offer for a house, and for some reason you actually did get some money, look into it. Ask somebody that knows something about something. I'm Michael Wordsworth. <laughs> Back in a moment. You're listening to RiverWestRadio.com. Are we in an economic recovery or a collapse? This is Michael Wordsworth with Words Worth Listening To. The U.S. financial system and the financial system of Europe, like the police, no longer serves a useful social purpose. In the U.S., the police have proven themselves to be a greater threat to public safety than private sector criminals. I just Googled police brutality and came up with 183 million results. Here are two recent brutal assaults, one deadly by police on hapless individuals. Right here, the list goes on. The cost of society, of the private financial system, is even higher. Oh, that's funny. Writing in Counterpunch on May 18th, Rob Urey reports that two years ago, Andrew Haldane, Executive Director for Financial Stability at the Bank of England, yeah. which is the UK's version of the Federal Reserve, said that the financial crisis, now four years old, will end the cost, will, end, will in the end cost the world economy between 60 trillion and 200 trillion in lost GDP. If Yuri's report is correct, this is an astonishing omission from a member of the ruling elite. Try to get your mind around these figures. The US GDP, the gross domestic product, the largest in the world is about 15 trillion. What Haldane is telling us is that the financial crisis will end up costing the world lost real income between four and third times, 13 times the size of the current gross domestic product of the United States. This could turn out to be an optimistic forecast, however. The actual event could turn out much worse. In the end, the financial crisis could destroy Western civilization, and I am not over-exaggerating that reality. Even if Yuri's report or Haldane's calculation is incorrect, the obvious large economic loss from the financial crisis is still unprecedented. The enormous cost of the financial crisis has one single source financial deregulation. Financial deregulation is likely to prove to be the mistake that destroys Western civilization. While we quake in our boots from fear of Muslim terrorists, it is financial deregulation that is destroying us. With helps from 
Jobs offshoring. Keep in mind that Haldane is a member of the ruling elite, not a critic of the system like myself. Not like people like... There's many good critics out there. Gerald Salente, Max Kaiser, Michael Hudson, Pam Martins, Nomi Prinz. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of critics, but I'm saying the people are out there. And they're making these points. Financial deregulation has had dangerous and adverse consequences. That's the point. Deregulation permitted financial concentration that produced banks, quote, too big to fail. If they're too big to fail, they're too big to bail. With a B. We can't bail them out. Nonetheless, they were declared too big to fail, requiring the general public to absorb the cost of the bank's mistakes and reckless gambling. Remember when you and I rack up gambling debts, we don't get bailed out. When our small businesses uh, over leverage themselves a thousand to one, which they can't even do, they don't get bailed out for their foolishness by the U.S. taxpayer. We're going to get the bill handed to us one day for this. It's going to come in the form of austerity measures and high inflation and a devalued dollar. That's not like the waiter comes up and says, here, Mr. and Mr. America, this is what you owe by percentage breakdown. It gets taxed across the board. The economy gets worse. And that's why I'm talking about this. Deregulation. It permitted banks to leverage a small amount of capital with enormous debt in order to maximize return on equity, thereby maximizing the instability of the financial system and the cost to society of the bank's bad bets. Deregulation allowed financial institutions to sweep aside the position limits on speculators and to dominate commodity markets, turning them into a gambling casino and driving up the prices of energy and food. Deregulation permits financial institutions to sell naked shorts. And the naked short is, it's an investment term on Wall Street. Let me help, it, help explain that. What, what, what do we care about naked shorts? Are you talking about somebody walking around with their uh, genitals hanging out? No, 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 no. This is a financial term, meaning you can basically place a bet just uh, without coughing up the actual money. That's what it is. I mean, it, for instance, it's not a good idea to uh, do naked shorts on uh, bonds. A short is basically saying, I bet that that company or bond will go down and lose value in the market. And you insure against it by putting up money. But in this case, when you sell naked shorts, you don't require the money up front. And it kind of becomes tough for the bookie to go around collecting the money. <laughs> And um, so in naked shorts, which means to sell a company's stock of gold and silver bullion that the seller does not possess into the market in order to drive down the price. The informed reader can add more items to this list. Um, they're naked short. I believe you can even naked short national bonds, which is not a good idea. It really isn't. Because when you short a company, you're basically the public opinion is saying, ooh, we think they're going to go down. And that has adverse effects on sales. As it affects the sales of the company. But the reality of the market should always come up. The cream should rise to the top. Uh, but if you short them too much, that might put them under. It might. The reality has to be that that company or bank is solvent, that they can surface. The dollar in its role as world reserve currency is the source of Washington's power. It allows Washington to control the international payment system and to exclude from the financial system those countries that do not do Washington's bidding. The dollar allows Washington to... Uh, apologize the dollar doesn't allow well it does <laughs> it allows it to get away with much but it's actually backed by washington itself and washington prints the money with which to pay its bills and to purchase the cooperation of foreign governments or to fund opposition within those countries whose governments washington is unable to purchase such as iran russia and china very difficult to buy off 
If the dollar was not the world reserve currency and actually reflected its true depreciated value from the mount in U.S. debt and running of the printing presses, Washington's power would be dramatically curtailed. The U.S. dollar has come close to its demise several times recently. In 2011, the dollar's value fell as low as 72 Swiss cents. Investors seeking safety for the value of their money flooded into Swiss francs, pushing the value of the franc so high that Switzerland's exports began to suffer. This is when, you're, when your money is too valuable in comparison to foreign currencies, your exports become unattractive. They want to buy your products with cheap money. They get, they get a deal when your currencies are down. The Chinese know all about this. They play this all times. The Swiss government responded to the inflow of dollars and euros seeking refuge in the franc by declaring that it would in the future print new francs to offset the inflow as a foreign currency in order to prevent the rise in the value of the franc. In other words, currency flight from the U.S. and Europe forced the Swiss to inflate in order to prevent the continuous rise in the exchange value of the Swiss currency. Prior to the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, the dollar was also faced with a run-up in the value of the euro as foreign central banks and OPEC members shifted their reserves into euros from dollars. The euro was on its way to becoming an alternative reserve currency. What? Oh, no. Two world reserve currencies? However, Goldman Sachs... Goldman Sachs, whose former employees dominate the U.S. Treasury and financial regulatory agencies, and also the European Central Bank and governments of Italy and, indirectly, Greece, Goldman Sachs helped the Greek government to disguise its true deficit. They handled those default credit swaps as well, thus deceiving the private European banks who were purchasing the bonds of the Greek government. That's why those Germans are so mad. They're hitting the streets, 200,000 of them, the article said. Google that. Mad Germans. What's this world come to? Once the European sovereign debt crisis was launched, Washington had an interest in keeping it going. It sends holders of euros fleeing into safe dollars, thus boosting the exchange value of the dollar. Despite the enormous rise in Washington's own debt and the doubling of the U.S. money supply, last year gold and silver were rapidly rising in price as measured in U.S. dollars, with gold hitting $1,900 an ounce and on its way to 2000 when suddenly short sales began denominating the bullion markets, the gold bullion markets, the markets in which the gold is sold. The naked shorts, naked shorts, meaning betting it will go down. It's kind of an insurance against it, hedge. The naked shorts of gold and silver bullion succeeded in driving the price of gold down $350 per ounce from its peak. Many informed observers believe that the reason Washington has not prosecuted the bankers for their known financial crimes is that the bankers serve as an auxiliary to Washington by protecting the value of the dollar in shorting bullion and rival currencies. This is actually illegal. They can't do this. What happens if Greece exit these, exits the EU on its own or by the German boot? What happens if the Germans give up on them? And Greece gets out of the EU. They're only 1% of the European economy. How much will this matter? It'll matter to the Greeks. Will it matter to us? What happens if the other EU members reject German Chancellor Merkel's austerity? Austerity is a... That's one of those vocabulary words I told you you should learn about. If you don't know it already, that's a... I always break it down. It's like another nice way of saying we're going to screw you. As the new president of France promised to do, <laughs> he promised that uh, he, he wouldn't put austerity onto the backs and burdens of the French people. Yes, the new France has a new president, if you haven't heard. Francois Hollande has replaced, replaced Nicolas Sarkozy, or Sarkozy, as he said. Well, here... The big concern in Europe is, is it going to break apart? Is the euro going to fall? Why should that matter to you? Well, that will greatly affect the U.S. Greatly. 
If European, if Europe breaks apart, do more investors flee to the doomed U.S. dollar? If they do, it might not be a refuge. Will a dollar bubble become the largest bubble in economic history? A dollar bubble means it's think of a balloon and you're blowing it up, and eventually that balloon's got to pop. You put enough air in there. Well, that's a, the bubbles. Bubble-driven economies are a term that you get into something and drive up the market price of it, and it keeps escalating, and there becomes a frenzy, and everybody gets into it, and it's like, oh, oh this is going to go, it's going to go crazy. Facebook's going to go, Google's going to go, oh, Microsoft, they're going to blow through the roof. Let's, uh, it's usually a tech sector thing, but we had a housing bubble. Anybody with uh, in the housing crisis right now or affected by it, they, they understand what a housing bubble is. Well, it burst, when made a big popping sound. When AIG fell, Fannie and Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they're like uh, Mike Tyson beat them up, and they're sitting in the corners wheezing. Well, will a dollar bubble, as people seek refuge to the dollar from Europe, become the largest bubble in economic history? When the dollar goes, and it will at this rate, it's going to go. Interest rates will escalate. When the dollar goes, interest rates will escalate and bond prices will collapse. It's quite a consequence. Everyone who sought safety in the U.S. Treasuries will be wiped out. We should all be aware that such outcomes are not part of the public debate. Recently, Bill Moyers interviewed Simon Johnson, formerly chief economist Economist of the International Money Fund, Monetary Fund, the IMF as it's commonly known, and currently professor at MIT, it turns out that the deregulation, which abolished the separation of investment banks from commercial banks, permitted Jamie Dimon's J.P. Morgan Chase to gamble with federally insured deposits. Let me break that down for you. What does it mean? Regulation, it's a term, Right. Nobody likes to be regulated, but certain aspects of society and especially financial systems. Americans, if you don't learn anything today, remember this. The two great things that you got to be concerned about when forming a government and standing behind its laws is the power to coin money and the power to tax. Everybody say that with me. Two most important things, coin money and pay taxes. These must be regulated. These are the two main gates in which civil society flows through and financial prosperity is found. Printing money. Well, usually the guy, the golden rule is he who has the guns rules. It's actually he who has the gold rules, but in this case, who has the guns has the gold. That's the way it comes down. Because uh, if you have the gold, they got the guns. It's like, well, give me your gold. It happened in America once. It happened. The government took back the gold and said, you can't have it. You got to turn it in for paper funny money. I believe that was 1938 under FDR. Well, anyhow, Bill, uh, Bill Moyers did this interview with Simon Johnson, chief economist of the IMF. And Moyers reports that Republicans remain determined to kill the weak Dodd-Frank law and restore full deregulation. Well... <laughs> That's a good start, but basically you got to put back the Glass-Steagall Act. Okay, there's two things I'd like you to learn today. That the power of to make money and to set taxes are the two most important things to regulate, but the Glass-Steagall Act is part of the de uh, regulation between commercial and investment banking. Let me help you out there because... The easiest metaphor I can think of to explain this, what the Glass-Steagall did, it acted as a firewall preventing mixing these funds together. Otherwise, what you essentially have is a building that on the back end says, bank, put your money here. And on the front end, or maybe a side entrance, it says, casino. And as you take your money from the counter at the bank, they walk it and they put it in the safe, but there's another window on the other end for the casino guys to pull it out. And they have, pay, they have uh, chips. They're, pr they're playing with plastic money, <laughs> just like credit cards are. 
but they have the chips and they take your housing loans, your student loans, your uh, retirement funds and mix them up with these bets. It ends up on 33 red to win or on some blackjack table. How would you feel about that? How would you feel if bankers weren't actually keeping your money, which they don't actually over 90% is loaned out now. So it's uh they actually don't have your money in the bank. And if you all ran and got your money, uh, that would become evident real quick. But the reason why banks are able to hold on to money is because people uh, feel that they can get their money out. Well, anyhow, Simon Johnson, he reported, I think deregulation is a re- recipe for disaster. Really. It, it, he's right in this case. Deregulation is a recipe for disaster, but it's already been done. So, I mean, the Dodd-Frank bill, Dodd-Frank law, it, it's no longer a bill. It's a law. It, uh, it was supposed to restore the Glass-Steagall Act, but that hasn't happened. And part of the problem is because too many of you out there are ignorant of the Glass-Steagall Act. Not criticizing you. Hey, we're all ignorant of something, but this is one freaking thing that you should really get in your head. It's called the Glass-Steagall Act. You can Google it or Wikipedia, but I'll break it down. It separates commercial from investment banking. If you don't have that wall of separation in that building, if there's not a physical wall there, it actually allows them to take the money and place it on the gambling tables. That's why there was a bank financial crisis in 2008. They were gambling. Wouldn't you love that? Well, now you're handed the bill. Johnson also says that a few people, particularly in and around the financial system, have become too powerful. Well, that's no shock. They were allowed to take a lot of risk, and they did. Massive damage to the economy. Betting on the blackjack tables with your savings. More than 8 million jobs were lost as a consequence. We're still struggling to get back anywhere close to employment levels where we were before 2008. And they've done massive damage to the budget. This damage to the budget is long-lasting. It undermines the budget when we need it to be stronger because the society is aging. We need to support Social Security and support Medicare on a fair basis. We need to restore and rebuild revenue, revenue that was absolutely devastated by the financial crisis. Revenue means actual money, not fake money. But money that ends up in your bank account. People need to understand the link between what the banks did and the budget. And too many people failed to do that. Consequently, the bankers, the banksters, as I like to call them, take a banker gangster, they're banksters, continue to receive mega benefits while imposing enormous social costs on societies. Few Americans and no Washington policymakers understand the dire situation. They are too busy hyping a non-existent recovery and the next war. Statistician John Williams, he reported that when correctly measured as a cost of living indicator, which the CPI no longer is, and no longer the core projection index doesn't include food and fuel since the 80s. The current inflation rate in the U.S. is 5 to 7% points higher than the officially reported rate, as every consumer out there knows. You know it because you're paying more at the cash register. The unemployment rate falls because and only because people unable to find jobs drop out of the labor force and are no longer counted as unemployed. That's it. Every informed person knows that the official inflation and unemployment rates are fictions. Yet the prostitute corporate whore media continue to report the rates with a straight face the way Hitler reported to the Germans that the war was going fine. Well, the way the government has rigged the measure of unemployment, it is possible for the U.S. to have a zero rate of unemployment and not a single person employed or in the workforce. Can you believe that? They can, they've got it set up where eventually you're not counted anymore. You will all be out of jobs, I mean, hypothetically. And the government, by this basis, would still be able to say, the unemployment rate isn't too bad. Yeah, what does it matter? What does it matter at all if we don't get aware of these issues? The way the government has the measure of inflation rigged, it is possible for your living standing, your, the, how much you can afford to live, the quality of life, to just fall while the government reports that you're better off. <laughs> you, you've lost everything, but you know what? Things are better than they were four years ago or eight years ago or 12 years ago. With an eye on the approaching dollar crisis, which will wreck the IMF the international financial system, the presidents of China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, 
and the Prime Minister of India. They met last month to discuss forming a new bank that would shield their economies and commerce from mistakes made by Washington and the EU. Mistakes by both. This is great. The cut and run. The five countries known as the BRICS. B-R-I-C-S. It's an easy way to remember it. Uh, They intend to settle their trade with one another in their own currencies and cease relying on the dollar. Is that news to you? Can I help you out there a little bit? They don't rely on the dollar. That's code for dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency. If that's the case, it'll be devalued. You'll be broke. Okay, I think we understand now. The fact that Russia, the two Asian giants, and the largest economies in Africa and South America are leaving the dollar's orbit sends a powerful message of lack of confidence in Washington's handling of financial matters. Why wonder why? It is ironic that the outcome of financial deregulation in the U.S. is the opposite of what its free market advocates promised. In place of highly competitive financial firms that live or die by their wits alone, without government intervention, we have unprecedented financial concentration. Massive banks, too big to fail, now send their multi-trillion dollar losses to Washington to be paid by heavily indebted U.S. taxpayers. That's you. You are the taxpayer whose real incomes have not risen in 20 years. The gangster banksters take home fortunes and annual bonuses for their success in socializing the free market. Banks, their losses and privatizing profits to the point of not even paying income taxes. In the U.S. free market, economists unleashed avarice and permitted it to run amok. Will the disastrous consequences discredit capitalism to the extent that the Soviet collapse discredited socialism? Will Western civilization itself survive the financial tsunami that deregulated Wall Street has produced? Ironic, isn't it, that the United States, the home of the indispensable people, stands before us like the likely candidate whose government will be responsible for the collapse of the West? I'm Michael Wordsworth. This has been Words Worth Listening To. We'll be back Wednesday at 3.30 promptly. I want you to take care of yourselves. Until then, goodbye.